going to get started now, and we're going to start with Dr. Vicki Seifert-Margolis, who's a Senior Advisor for Science Innovation and Policy in the FDA Commissioner's Office. Vicki's been an active member of our planning committee. She's also uh, tasked at the FDA with bringing innovation to the agency. So we're all looking forward to Vicki's remarks. Thanks, Lynn. Um, so I'm going to try to keep you awake um, and talk about, talk about this issue around data and big data and what we can do in sort of terms of what we can do and what we are doing as opposed to what we can't do. So I think we've heard a lot about what we can't do today and how hard it is, except for Richard. He was he was giving us, I think, more optimistic, <laughs> ironically coming from the FDA. I just want to point that out. So um, um, I think that there's a lot we can do. There's a lot we are doing. And I don't think it's always really expensive. And I don't think it's always really hard. I think it's just about doing it. And I also think that we have to be mindful that what we're talking about here and building on the last session on standards in my, in my mind, and this is my view, not necessarily official FDA view, but my view, having spent 10 years prior to coming to the FDA in academia doing analysis of large data sets and clinical data in a large clinical trials consortium, now coming to the FDA and really working on how do we bring scientific computing to the agency and working closely with Eric uh, Praxis, our new CIO from j and I think we have to be creative, and I think that we have to be flexible. Because if there was one thing I learned in 10 years of clinical trials in immune-mediated diseases is that the endpoints of 1999 didn't look at all like the endpoints of 2009. And so if you set out to try to predefine everything, you aren't going to be able to do it. And I would wager to say that the patient of 2012 in terms of how we characterize them, even for basic characteristics like race, which by the way are already giving us problems, and I'm going to show you some examples, um, are going to be fundamentally different when we start having genome sequence. And it's all in my estimation about what's the question and what's the experimental context. And having that context of the question and the experiment will drive how we look at data. And I think we have to just keep in mind that standards are important, and to the extent we can do as much to keep things as standard as possible, that's great. But with the knowledge and the full wherewithal that what the question is that we're asking is going to drive how we look at the data, what fields we pull, and will also drive how we normalize that data. So I, I really think that this is a, a balancing act in large part. So I want to talk about a couple of efforts that have been underway at the FDA and sort of tell you quickly, what is sort of the current state, even with the study data tabulation model in hand? And let's take that as a given. We know 40% of the data is still coming in, maybe a little bit more on paper, and maybe not necessarily standardized. We also know that there are still a large number of reviewers, and maybe Eric's going to show this wonderful photo, that regardless of how the data is coming in, they print it out, and they tape it to the walls of their offices, and they look at it. So they're not necessarily availing themselves to the attributes of standardized data or advanced analytical tools or advanced visualization tools because it's not how they're used to doing it. So the underlying culture and process that exists in large organizations obviously plays a tremendous role in how well and how efficiently and effectively we actually can implement some of these changes. So right now, the sponsor sends TLFs, as was mentioned, and if they're doing it nicely, they send it to us in this nice SDTM format, comes to the reviewer, the reviewer looks at it, and as I said, sometimes they're looking at it electronically, sometimes they're not, sometimes it's coming in in paper. But if they have questions, they're going back and they're asking the sponsor, basically. You know, many, many cases. And I spent a lot of time talking with statisticians and a lot of time talking with reviewers. And we don't have in our hands any way to nimbly look at the multidimensionality of our data. A lot of this data is still relatively flat. So ideally, what we'd want is more of what I call the, oh, <laughs> not that, <laughs> the information, the information in a more raw format and tools that allow us to compare trials. 
and programmers that allow us to manage our data and allow us to take things out of SAS, pull the fields that we need based on what the question is that we're asking, and provide those in a format that's in a table that can be laid into advanced analytical tools, can be used by statisticians, et cetera. I spent a lot of time thinking about this part right here and what our reviewers are doing. And I can tell you, the statisticians are doing most of the programming. Statisticians are doing a large variety of the data quality work. And the data management layer at the agency is probably not as um, helpful as it could be. So we need to think hard about that. We also need to think about what kinds of things we can do to manipulate the data with advanced analytical tools and how we, once we move into this system of collecting data off of EMRs, if we, if, when we get there, how that's going to implement and how that will be rolled in to the process we currently have. Because right now the communication between sponsors and reviewers is probably not going to be the answer the way it's currently constructed. So I'm going to skip this slide. One of the things we did was we sort of did a comparison within the agency of two different use cases. One of them was we took the approach of taking legacy data and a lot of it, 101 NDAs. And we converted all of the data to a standardized format with no predetermined scientific question. Then we took another set of data. We took converted data or unconverted data. So we took this nice, clean, converted data that we did up here in the legacy data conversion, and we took data that was basically raw as we got it. And we said, can we answer a specific question using some tools? And the tool we chose is nothing all that magnificent, but it's a pretty reasonable tool called Amalga. It's a tool developed by Microsoft. It was actually developed for point of care um, data integration. But the idea was, how much can you buy with what I'll call normalization on the fly out of your raw data versus spending the time and energy. And the legacy data conversion pro process was expensive, both in time, um, people hours, and money. Um, and so that was the question we set out to ask. So for approach one, <clears throat> we supported the conversion of 101 legacy clinical trial data to the SDTM and ADAM formats to enable exploration of the data, basically um, patient-centered outcomes research. And this was part of a larger project, which was a $21 million project funded from Mer American Recovery and Reinvestment Act money. There were three key elements to this project. One was the creation of a clinical trial repository. That was a large project, and it was using a very, very standard data model approach. And Eric is going to tell you a little bit about how one of the things we've learned in this process is while there's value in that, we think that there are much more facile, cheaper, ways to do it with agile software development. The other piece of this was to actually convert the legacy data. And then the third piece of it was to engage in actual research on the data. And so we did that. We worked with Johns Hopkins University. We moved large amounts of data, 61 HIV combination NDAs, um, that we worked on collaboratively with Johns Hopkins University. We did it under contract and with an NDA, and we were able to fully share some of the lessons that we learned that I think are critical for all these efforts is that the subject matter expertise was, was key in enabling the Hopkins University team to be able to do the work they wanted to do. And it really required people within the FDA who had not only seen trial data from one company, but had actually seen trial data across the board from all of the filings that came in. So they had this incredible knowledge base to bring to the data and to, uh, and to bring in terms of understanding the protocols. I will tell you the Hopkins people were shocked when we sent them the protocols and the data. They had not seen data like this before, huge amounts of data. So in the legacy data conversion process, and I don't, I'm trying to be mindful of time, one of the things that was clear is it was important to understand the difference between this conversion activity and a sponsor's activities in support of regulatory submission, because we were trying to take all of the data converted so that it could be integrated and there could be multiple trials compared. So what did we learn? We learned that the scientific questions drive the details in the conversion, that clinical and scientific expertise is required to determine how to reorganize the data and how to fit it into whatever standard it is that you need to answer the question. Um, we learned that terminology dictionary harmonization requires clinical expertise. I can't underscore this enough, that we really need the reviewers and the subject matter experts in there to help. 
Statisticians were required to translate the questions into analyzable components, and quality control of the converted data is essential, but incredibly time consuming. Um, and we also learned that this activity of converting the data is intensive and expensive. This costs about $7 million. Data quality and harmonization are fundamental to successful data analysis, but it's not clear that you can predetermine everything that you want to in terms of a standard. Standardization does not ensure quality. I think this is a key point because we saw a lot of standard stuff come in, but it wasn't high quality. We saw very standardized files of patient initials. We saw files of in three different languages that were highly standardized, where reviewers were Googling to translate back into English, the case report forms. We saw a lot of interesting stuff around racial categor categorization. I th and this is something one would think is straightforward, but is actually not. So what would happen is if there were five racial fields and there was a, a mix, say half Latino, half African American, they would be put into a column that information, the person would be coded as either African American or Latino, and then there'd be this extra information about them in some other column in this sort of additional information field, which became quite complicated when we started looking through it. So even though it was quote unquote standardized and we were checking off categories of race, it didn't ensure quality because those particular categories were not capturing what was actually the racial identity of the patients. So if not done well, conversion to a standard format has the potential to adversely affect data quality and analysis. We really have to, again, know what we're asking and what we want to ask of the data and what the context is to be able to get out of the data what we need to answer the question. Standardization does not imply that data is fit for purpose. Standardized data may or may not answer our questions, may be useful or not useful for future analysis. Can converted data be so fit for a specific purpose that it's not otherwise useful? These are all issues that came up over the course of three years of really digging into data and looking at it. And in some instances, conversion to a standard, especially when converting data for a specific goal or purpose, resulted in a loss of traceability from the source. So in, st in standardizing, we were losing information that we thought was important because we were making assumptions about the data that actually took some of the information that was informative out of it. So I think these are all things to be mindful of as we think about how we look at data and how the assumptions that we make as we move forward in these processes. So the other thing I think that's important is that we saw a lot of extraneous stuff coming in. And one thing is clear is that not all the collected data that is going on out there needs to come to the FDA. It's really just clogging the system. And in fact, I think electronic submission is going to make this worse rather than better. Because at least what was happening before is trucks and pallets were coming in on paper. Now we're getting filings that would, I'm told actually from a, a, a pharma, a pharma person that one of their submissions they estimated would be paper piled to the height of the Empire State Building. But they were able to send us everything because it was electronic. So the question is, do we want all that? <laughs> and what are we going to do with it? And somebody has to look at it. So ideally, initial study planning phases should exclude data that the FDA does not need or want. We don't want subject initials. In some instances, the original data was unnecessarily confusing. So as I said, the original term gypsy was converted to unknown. And that was one of the fields that came in as an identifier, gypsy. So <laughs> some parting thoughts um, are shown here. The standard should be implemented in the same way across studies. You need to create business rules. It allows for identification of areas for improvement. Standardization will not solve all of the problems with study data. It may illuminate them, but that we need to really think hard about what we want to do with the data and what the questions are that we're asking of the data. So very quickly, in Approach tool, we, 2, we used a tool that basically allowed us to take data out of a variety of formats, text form, fa formats, imaging files, XML files, and we created parsers that transform the data on the fly, depending on the questions that we were asking of the data. And we did a use case, and this was to take data out of CDRH. It was a one-year pilot, which culminated in the successful integration and analysis of dis disparate regulatory data sets, including post-market and pre-market data being integrated together. And basically, I don't have time to go into this, but what we found is that we were able to integrate post-market and pre-market data. We were able to learn a lot of new interesting things from the data, depending on the question we were asking using this approach. And we feel that 
some combination of using some level of standardization and advanced tools that allow you to integrate data and do analysis on the fly, as they say, are probably necessary to really help us move forward in these advanced analytics, whether it be multiple clinical trial integration studies or even for single product applications. And these are just some of the challenges that we encountered and some of the efforts that are underway. So one of the things that we've learned is that it's hard to know on the, on the parser side how many SQL queries you have to write and how you're going to set them up for sort of pre-canned queries depending on your data. So you need to have people who can help you with that and who can take the questions, who can understand what the data is that's coming in and then how to parse. But we've also learned that there are some processes in review that are highly repeated um, and that there are opportunities to actually pre-write some of those uh, queries to enable us to flexibly integrate multiple types of data without having to go to all the time to pre-standardize it. So again, I think it's going to be some mixture, and I think Eric will probably follow on with some of those thoughts. Are we taking questions now? Or? And I'll close because I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Vicki. Now we're going to move on to our case studies, and Carolyn Compton will start us off. Carolyn is the CEO and president of Critical Path Institute. Carolyn brought her passion for all things standards to CPATH with her from the NCI, where she was director of the Office of Biorepositories and Biospecimen Research. Thank you, Lynn, and thank you for the organizers for inviting me. To the this chance to be a case study um, in data standardization, data pooling for a very specific purpose, which CPATH is engaged in. And it, and it points up, we are, in fact, a good case in point for a lot of the, uh, the points that have been made by speakers today, including the ones that Vicki just made. What CPATH actually does is act as a trusted third party to develop standards, measurement standards, method standards, and data standards with our 41 industry partners and all of our academic partners. Um, but we do this for a very specific purpose. The purpose is to s formally submit these consensus-driven standards to the FDA for a qualification, which is a formal process prescribed by them for pre-review and approval. Once they are approved in this qualification process, they go out into the public domain and stand as a standard for anyone, whether or not you participated in their development. This is exactly how we do it. We are a not-for-profit 501c3 that has been um, launched by the Critical Path Initiatives Program of the FDA. Um, we convene consortia um, to bring together the best science and in this fashion um, create shared risk and shared costs for the creation of these standards. It also drives consensus. And we iteratively include the FDA during this process. So there's, there's regulatory participation and guidance at every step. And then at the end, we officially prepare a qualification submission to the FDA. Um, and then they either approve the standard or not. Um, and this is something um, uh, that they call a drug development tool, one of these standards. They actually have three categories of these, which they have um, defined as biomarkers, clinical outcomes assessment, and animal models, although CPAP does not engage in animal model standards development, except where it impacts preclinical studies for toxicology. Now, the FDA, um, this is a particular um, uh, slide from one of Charles Cooper's talks from CEDAR who, uh, that, that outlines um, the need for standards from the point of view of regulatory approval of products. The, the point being made here is that non-standardized electronic data limits the quality and efficiency of the review process. It's difficult to integrate data sets. It limits the ability to ask in-depth questions, and it increases variability and, and, and increases time for review. And therefore, um, these same issues um, are, are affecting the qualification process of the standards that we're developing since these go to review groups, scientific review groups, for um, scientific approval. 
uh, I, I'm going to pick out one of the six global consortia that we have built um, since 2006 when we began. Um, these consortia do operate globally because all of our company members are global companies. We have more than a thousand scientists and 41 companies, the, the who's who of Big Pharma, participating in this consensus science effort. But I want to pick out one of our consortia, the Coalition Against Major Diseases, which is focused on diseases of the brain and uh, peripheral nervous system, to illustrate a, a specific specific use of, of, of standards uh, to uh, develop tools for drug development. And, and, and basically, the, the, the point of developing drug development tools and standards is to address the challenge that we now have in, in this country and internationally of the unsustainable time and costs that it takes to get a new drug to market. More than 10 years and more than a billion dollars to get one single drug to market. The focus of these standards is on process improvement for the entire drug development and translational research pipeline. So in CAMD, the, the tools are to specifically advance effective treatments for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. And we do qualify biomarkers as a drug development tool, but we also so um, develop data standards to create integrated databases of clinical trials data based on standardized data and, and built on top of those standardized databases, develop accepted for use quantitative disease models that allow you to model clinical trials to optimize um, clinical trial design. And uh, the, in fact, the very first CDISC therapeutic area, that is disease-specific data standards, were developed for Alzheimer's disease within um, CAMD and published in September uh, 2011. Uh, the start point for us in establishing our, our, this is true shared data, coalesced, pooled, shared data, nine, starting with nine member companies who agreed to share their control trial data from 22 clinical trials in Alzheimer's disease. The data were not in a common format and they needed to be combined in a consistent manner in order for us, us to be able to build our drug development tool. And all data were remapped to the CDIS standard um, and de-identified and then pooled. The result was that we were able to build a new in silico modeling tool um, that was really based on our ability to create this database. The, um, the contributing organizations had to do some uh, to some work um, in order to make this happen. They had to go through a corporate approval process to share data and to de-identify it for secondary use. And we further, in, in CPATH, de-identified the data to conform with HIPAA safe harbor requirements. And this is just one illustration of the heterogeneity of the application of a single so-called standardized cognitive test, the Alzheimer's disease assessment score for cognitive impairment. This is a standard tool um, for neurologists that, that are used to assess Alzheimer's disease patients. And you can see here that, um, that the implementation of this test across those 22 trials um, differed in the number of questions, in, in the order of the questions and tasks um, addressed, and, and even the same item was scored differently um, between trials. So this really required standardization before we could go on to the final phase of building our modeling tool for clinical trials. This required uh, data from three different sources. We took data from uh, ADNI, which is a natural history study, uh, where very much like the Framingham study, where it, it, the inner patient variability and patient-specific factors, along with imaging and CFS biomarkers, um, came to us as a part of the data set. This was not standardized by a CDISC standard, but it, they, the, all the data was harmonized according to a standard used in uh, one data set and all of the rest of the data sets that were um, contributed to ADNI followed suit, but they were not in the same standard that we used um, to construct our database. 
place. Um, a, and, and the third source of data was reliant on published data on treatment effect. We could not get companies, even in our own consortia, to contribute treatment level data um, for our database. We're working on that. Um, and there is some uh, sentiment that we <laughs> that we may be able to achieve this. But the point is that we would not have been able to build the modeling tool, the clinical trial simulation and modeling tool without this placebo effect data coming from our standardized database. It would have been impossible. And what this tool allowed us to do, again, this was a very specific purpose for which we build this standardized database, but it allowed us to to merge these data flavors, to create uh, a tool that would parse patients into specific groups that would allow you to see differences in disease trajectories over time. These were all 65-year-old males who were not APO for, uh, APOE4 carriers, so they all look alike in the databases, but in fact, when you were able to merge the placebo effect, the natural history, and the treatment effect data, you were able to see that there are three um, classes of patients, all with different trajectories of disease. And, and a Seeing this kind of uh, a distinction emerge from the modeling tool would allow you to design a trial much more wisely. You could, it would inform patient selection, study size, study duration, study feasibility, and even study costs. And in fact, um, our colleagues at Pfizer have told us that if four years ago they had had a tool like this, um, the bapanuzumab uh, failure um, that just occurred may have been um, a completely different uh, trial or may have not may not have been done at all um, so really when we're talking about the value proposition of data standards um, I agree totally with with Vicki and and with Eric I've, I've, I've heard him say the same thing that it's dependent on your research goal what you want to accomplish and so um, the value proposition of building a database like this is really based on um, the the goal of being able to develop a drug development tool that could possibly revolutionize um, the the translational research, um, at least when it comes to uh, clinical trials, um, that piece of it, which, which really is where most of the money, uh, time, and effort is spent and where most of the spectacular losses are seen. Um, so if we focus our shared data um, at, on uh, databases built on standardized data to develop these new drug development tools, we really believe that and uh, rough calculations that, that we have made that we can cut um, drug development times by four to five years. Um, and, and the approach that we use for Alzheimer's disease is now being applied to other research projects. Other um, organizations, foundations, patient groups have um, noticed what we've done in Alzheimer's disease, and uh, we are, in fact, doing for them what we did for AD in Parkinson's disease, polycystic kidney disease, and tuberculosis um, funded by by uh, the, the Gates Foundation. We did gain new insights in doing this. Um, we learned that uh, legacy data conversion, um, just like everyone else has said, is resource intensive but worthwhile for specific purposes. All told, our, the building of that database for Alzheimer's disease, the, the merger of all of those patients yielded a database of 6,100 Alzheimer's disease patients. Um, and it took us nine months to de-identify the data and to convert it to a data standard. Um, the assurance that is needed that a specific data set will be useful, it really needs to be assessed up front. Do you need to do this? And then if you decide that you do need to do it, I, I again agree with Vicki, it's, it's all about selectivity. So use the data that you need, convert the data you need, maybe not everything. Um, and this point was brought up in, in previous discussion as well. Um, unless, of course, it costs you no time or no money to do so. Um, new insights can be obtained from data converted to a common standard and aggregated to enable queries and analysis that would not be possible from a non-standardized database. You can't 
Google a non-standardized database, you may ha be able to build ways um, to draw the data out. But, but uh, y either way, you're spending time and resources either to build the conversions or to standardize the database. And, and it's, a, it's a balancing act as to which is more convenient. And, and, and someone said this earlier, that you always learn something new when you go back and look at the pooled data. And that, that is exactly, was exactly our experience. The the addition of standardized data from other sources, prospective and or retrospective, actually becomes simplified and expands the power and utility of a standardized data resource once you build it and if you have implemented that standard in a prospective fashion in other studies. And then your database just continues to grow over time and, and in power. Um, I want to point out that um, these kinds of drug development tools that uh, we are developing with our partners in CPATH um, and the uh, based on the data standards that we are developing with CDISC are really um, primarily applicable um, to the these phases of the uh, drug development pipeline where it involves clinical experimentation, but they could also apply um, in specific instances to post-approval um, monitoring and gathering of data and uh, insights from uh, standardized data as well. Um, I, I do want to point out that, as was pointed out earlier, uh, that uh, the, the, the Prescription Drug User Fee Act goals actually talk about clinical terminology standards um, with the goal of, com of completing clinical data terminology and detailed implementation guides for data standardization by 2017. So there still is this focus by the FDA having specific goals for the development and use of data standards, but again, for a very specific use. And from CEDAR uh, comes this list of 55 therapeutic disease areas that they um, have put on their website and for which they are um, asking uh, the development of, of therapeutic area data standards within five years, the so-called 55 and 5 uh, list. Um, this challenge um, it, it has been taken up really by um, uh, the new Transcelerate group. They also recognize the need for data standards, at least for product um, approval and their submissions, and they're recognizing that the FDA is calling calling for these to uh, decrease uh, review time. Um, and we are at, uh, at CFAST now working with Transcelerate as well to, um, to develop the data standards uh, for their therapeutic area priorities um, within the, the uh, Transcelerate initiative. And, and this, this particular session um, also focuses on governance considerations for data pooling and data standardization. So I just wanted to end with some of the governance considerations that we've had to face um, in doing what we do. There are actual governance rules for developing the data standards themselves and the need for collaborative expert input and consensus. Rules of the road for merging the data um, based on our, our best practices would um, involve use of high quality data, use of data standards that the FDA accepts if you are focused in fact, on regulatory approval efficiency and using data standards end to end. And the rules, there, there are also are rules for accessing the data. We've talked about this. Our database is open to investigators who are qualified. It goes through a data access committee. But, but at the end of the day, the tool that we're developing on top of that will be completely publicly available. And then rules for um, access to the qualified drug development tools um, will be completely free. Um, so that is uh, one good case in point for the, the data standard use for a specific purpose um, focused on FDA. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. We're going to move on to Dr. Eric Paraxlis, who is the Chief Information Officer and Chief Scientist of Informatics at the FDA. And before the FDA, Dr. Praxlis was Senior VP of R&D Information Technology at J&J, &J, where he spearheaded the use of Transmart at J&J &J and beyond. <laughs> 
You know you're being quietly effective in your new job when you get invited to do a talk from what you did four years ago at your old job. So I'll just take that as a compliment. Um, you know, and actually, I, I do want to thank J&J. Um, this is a case study of something that we did uh, back in, I guess it was 2008, 2009. Um, and it really, it really is a, a, a talk about sociology a little bit more than anything else. Um, you know, simply put, I had been asked at one point at J&J &J to bring together informatics and data across their immunology, oncology, and biotechnology franchises. And these, of course, had been separate companies at one point that had lots of products, lots of different standards, lots of clinical trials. And so when they were talking to me, I said, that's fine, it's real simple. I have to have all the data. If you give me all the data, I'll make something work for you. And, you know, it was very, even at a company like J&J, &J, and we were on the biotech side, you know, a lot of the research folks didn't have access to the clinical data, the preclinical data. You know, it's it just there's a silo next to you, whether you see it or not. It's 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 probably there, and so we very quickly decided to not reinvent anything. And so I looked around and I came across I2B2, you know, a, a fantastic uh, bit of infrastructure funded through the CTSAs at NIH. Uh, Zach Kohani and the folks up at Harvard had built it, and it was really an amazing data warehousing tool that had been used for EMR data and clinical. Data. So so I, I used it. Um, we decided to use it. We decided to go completely open source um, with this system and we decided to put it on Amazon's public cloud EC2 which was pretty heretical for for 2007 and 2008 but quite frankly it was 1 15th the cost of doing it inside and we we studied the security of the assessments and it was just as good as ours it was fine so so we decided to do this and it was starting to work well we got a lot of trials in there and you know the the comment about standards I'll make is you know just use what you got and go patients are waiting Right, so you know what we would do is, of course, we wanted to do this thing with live on college. So we we looked at CDIS and everything that worked, we use, and we look at other things. Everything that works, you use, and then at some point, you do some dictionaries, and then you have really smart humans, curators, and folks that help you align the data and get it in. I mean, I I think if you've got a project to do, just do it, um, and, and and get it done. Now we weren't doing to be really clear about this. This was really a, a data warehouse for hypothesis generation, biomarker research. Okay, we just you know, we still don't have a disease-modifying treatment for asthma, but we've run all these asthma trials. What might we know? How might we learn something? So to, to the point that both Vicky and Carol made, it's a very different thing if you try to automate pre-market submission review. Yes, that's a factory. You want widgets, you know, Henry Ford, get it done, make it concise, push it through, make the process work, make it effective, take time out. But this was more about R&D. This was more about... People talk about signal detection. I think I'm more of a fan of saying signal management because detection is just poor size. <laughs> you know, it does You know, management is deciding which ones to act on and what to do. You can always just get out the money and run the experiment with the p-value with all the zeros when the time comes. I think it's much more interesting to understand how to quickly understand and rule out hypotheses. So we had some initial success to this, and this was when the Innovative Medicines Initiative in, in the EU was really getting going. And some of you probably have heard of IMI in the EU. It's a quite a large consortium, multi-billion euros, half put in from the European pharmaceutical manufacturers, half put in from the European Commission. And the very first project they stood up was something called Ubiopred, and it was a, it was a project to look at severe asthma in 5,000 patients, most of which were severe enough where they were going to get bronchial tissue. So in the planning meetings for this, I got asked, I got sent over by, I was at Senecor R&D at the time, and I got, I got asked to go over and meet. And it was really fantastic because there was like nine pharmas in the room. There were like 30 academics all designing a clinical trial. You know, and it, it sounds like chaos, but I got to tell you, it was as much fun as, as pizza at graduate school because it, it was a lot of ideation. And, you know, the, the academics were doing things like nosomics and all these brilliant ideas about the types of analytics you could do. And, of course, us on the farm, we knew how to run a trial. We knew what consent had to look like. We knew you knew what operations and, and supplies had to look like. And so we started looking at this and, you know, they hadn't really thought about the data which is what you get when you run a 5,000 patient trial. So, you know, we started talking about that and we, we started getting to that. And people were very, very open to this. And this, this went on at Imperial College. And then, you know, then it was like, okay, well, okay, this company's doing this and this company's doing that and their system. To, and it's like, guys, let's just talk about bringing it together and how you actually make it work. So what we did, um, and this was, we actually set this up in the first week and we decided to do a little pilot. And I really want to take my, I don't know if any of my colleagues from GSK are in the room, but the GSK folks had run one of the largest COPD studies ever called Eclipse. And they'd had it for years, didn't, didn't meet its endpoints, but it was probably one of the richest things. And they said, you know, we've got this Eclipse data. We've never really been able to look at it the way we want to without biostatisticians taking a lot of time. They said, what do you think? So we, I said, well, let's take a look at it at the system. So what we literally did in 90 days, 
Yi K. Go, the head of bioinformatics at Imperial College, stood up a, a version of Transmart on his cloud. We moved a large cohort of the GSK Eclipse data in. AZ put some data in, and J&J &J put some data in. And three months later, they were all looking at it and doing it. No one could believe it had happened so early. We went over to Brussels to the, to the EU and showed them, quite frankly, how, how simple it was. Now, again, no p-values with lots of zeros behind it. But what happened more than anything else was the incentives aligned. Right? We, all, we all had one goal aligned. And now, actually, the, the system ended up being its own call. Now, the e tricks is actually the knowledge management layer ac across IMI, and that, that's kind of where that went. So, you know, I just was asked to kind of give a, a quick case study of, of what it can look like. And I think, you know, just to touch on some of the points of the session here, I think, you know, the data is going to take you so far. It really is an experiment. You're doing in silico science a lot of the time. So think about accuracy and precision relative to the experiment you're trying to run. Just because it's in a computer versus a beaker, it doesn't have to get harder. You'd hope it would get more simple. And if you're looking for signal detection, I mean, you know, one of the things, of course, you try to do on the farmer side is you want to fail fast. You don't want to waste patient time or money on drugs that aren't going to work. You want to, you want to rule things out. So get me 60 or 70 hypotheses that I can rule out. And then I could be really interested in the one that I can't because I can't disprove it, right, and, and, and going forward. So, you know, a couple things of this. One is I think that you can use standards to the points of the need you actually have at hand, too. I'm a big proponent of open source software and technology. I really do believe that we don't have to spend the millions and millions of dollars that often go on to do some of these things. I, I often get asked... Um, uh, you know, we sitting in a meeting and someone said, well, you know, I'm so-and-so from this patient advocacy organization. And someone just told me, you know, 30,000 patients willing to give their records. And I was told it was $150 million to do it. And I'm like, you're off by about a factor of a hundred, you know, <laughs> to, to do that. It really is just, just to get something like that done. So, uh, that's the, uh, the quick transmart story. I want to thank the folks at J and J Paul Stoffel, Sue Dillon, um, Bill Height and Jay Siegel, who were heretical enough to let me do something like that, because back then it was unheard of, and I think they do it again. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. I think we're going to open up the floor right now for questions before we turn to the panel. And I'd like to ask the first question. Um, so both uh, Vicki and Carolyn talked about having data standards that it depends a lot on the question that is going to be asked for the, the value of data standards. So most of what we've been talking about with sharing clinical data is a lot of secondary and tertiary analysis of, of uh, clinical data. So the people that are doing the secondary and the tertiary analysis may not have the same question in mind that the primary uh, clinical trial was designed for. And in fact, most of the, the trials that NIH funds and would like to get as much use of as possible would be for questions that have not yet been developed to be asked. So wouldn't that say that you might want to put data standards in at the beginning for all the clinical trials? I mean, I, look, I think there are a couple things that we're talking about here when we talk about standards. Clearly, I think one of the things that, that Carolyn talked about that's important is defining disease and what I would call having a clear understanding of clinical phenotypes and how we're characterizing them. And there's a huge need to do that to really develop a, a, a taxonomy of disease that's clear so that we can understand what we're talking about and who we're talking about and which subsets we're talking about. And as we moved in targeted therapies and as we get into the human genome, this is going to become even more important because we know not every type 2 diabetes patient is the same, yet we all call them that. So yes, to me that is a, a standard, but it is not about a data standard. It's about a definition. And it's about having clarity of understanding what it is we're talking about and who it is we're talking about. Whether you sit down to say, okay, we're going to drive that by taking case report forms and making everybody talk about a patient the same way in a case report form field, or whether you do that to bring clarity to the practice of medicine and disease definition, I'm not sure I care, but I actually think the end game here is about clarity of patient populations and who we're talking about. And so... I think that's what your project demonstrated, was you have a lot of different characteristics 
to define different types of cogn cognition in Alzheimer's and getting a handle on that is very helpful, not just for that particular case report form or that particular clinical trial or that particular regulatory finding, but quite frankly, for the field. So to me, that's an important end game. I'm also not saying that we don't need formats and we don't need standards. I'm just saying let's be thoughtful about the fact that when we do these standards, they aren't solving as many problems as we all might hope. They aren't solving the quality problem. They aren't solving the definition problem. They aren't solving the knowledge problem. And they certainly aren't solving the analytics problem. So, you know, it, it makes it easier. It's good to have. But I look at five years and 50 therapeutic areas and lack of clarity of disease definition. And I go, okay, wh where are we going to wind up? And where should we be spending our efforts? And how much do we spend, again, depending on the question, to get absolutely 100% pristine data, which we never get, sort of what's the sweet spot to answer the question, even in a primary analysis? And Eric likes to talk about this, what data is good enough and how much do we need. And I think we all strive for 100% clean, but we aren't going to get there. So, you know, it, it's, it's to me, it's about, again, striking the right balance. It's not to say no standards or all standards. It's, it's how do we make sense? And part of that is going to be about questions. So let's take review. There are certain questions, for example, in farm talks that when you talk to farm talks reviewers, they ask. And they will want to look at it. And they will pretty much want to look at it every single time. That's a great place to do standardization. But if you're looking at type 1 diabetes and, ca and trying to characterize pancreatic function that's left, we've been debating area under the curve for C-peptide for 10 years. I'm not sure that's the place to make a decision to say you've got to collect it every time with a four-hour fasting and we're going to take the area under the curve. I don't think we're clear on that. So, you know, that's, that's what I'm getting at. How do we do this in a more informed way and integrate disease definition and clarity and taxonomy, which is where I really think much of the work needs to be done? I don't know if you want to add. Yeah, there's a point of clarification. I don't want to. Are you saying that you think the, the direction we're going with 55 and 5 is not a good investment of resource? No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that when we look at the effort that we put in and we, we did the experiment and we standardized the data, it didn't fix everything magically. Okay, okay so I just want to make sure we set our expectations at the right place. And if I could, it matters on how much we're spending on it. Yeah, and it matters on time and money. I mean, you know. I have a question for Eric, Carol Memora from UC Berkeley. And you mentioned open architectures and many decades of in licensing into open standards repositories have actually resulted in many that conflict with one another or just don't achieve the goal of yeah. ha having been deposited, then everyone can use it. So what do you recommend that we proactively do going forward to avoid some so of these conflicts up front? It's a great question. You know, one of the thing, one of the ways I, I think about that and using, you know, what happened in semiconductors, some of these other things as, as, as an analogy as well is that I actually don't believe in aggregating things until you really have a good handle of what you want to ask it. Um, so, so technologically, for example, I'm actually not a big fan of data warehouses. I'd rather do very light, agile, hypothesis-specific marts. And I know that just sounds like IT speak, but what I'm really saying is aggregate the source around the question quickly and effectively. So what you're not doing is you're not building a lot of bank, a lot of detail, a lot of things in it. You may grab a different technology the next time you go. The standards will have moved. You know, so you're not you're not maintaining a lot of the the history into these things. And again, I, I think that one of the things I try to do because there are a lot of conflicting things out there. There's actually a lot of great commercial offerings as well, right? A lot of folks have done uh, John Quackenbush at Dana Farber has done great stuff. You know, on, on the commercial side was with some of the things um, based on I, I guess like Salvers owns the products now. But what I had done at the time was just like you know NIH had just compiled this great stuff. It was available. The public had paid for it. What if an industry group took it and proved it and gave it back. I just thought that was a good experiment to run on the technology side um, as well. Why are you not a fan of big data warehouses? What's wrong with that if we do it correctly? I'm not, I'm not against it. Again, it mattered on the question. If you have a historic, so for example, if we were starting now with agile marts in oncology and we were doing them, say you're talking about solid tumors or liquid tumors or all the different ways you could think about oncology, right? If you were doing that over time and growing it, 
as an asset, like at FDA, if we were able to do that and take every, do that over time in every pre-market cancer fog, that's probably a very worthwhile thing to do. But if it's going to get to a, a set of cost, you know, the minute you put, you know, so say you design it because you have 50 questions. When you've answered the 50th question, it is an instantly an expense. And what we see is a lot of places can't carry that expense long time or people lose interest in it. And we're doing the next, j and is doing the next Transmart for just that reason. It worked well, but it worked to a point and go. So I, I, I tend to think of, if you think of that life cycle through it, it's okay. Don't lose the data though, you, you can migrate it. So I, I think it's just, if I, was, if I was a company building my IP, I would be more warehouse driven. If I'm at Cedar looking at things, I'd probably be therapeutically driven, but I wouldn't wanna get too focused. I mean, I'll go back to what both Carolyn and Vicky said about cancer and, and disease definition. I think cancer is one of those places where we know there's gonna be a lot of movement in how we're defining the disease. I have a comment and then a, a question. I didn't realize that uh, Transmart was initially started at, with the UBiopred project, and uh, it made me reflect on one of my first meetings at IMI where I, we were talking to them about what their needs are, and the person designing the case report forms for the trial that they were starting with UBiopred didn't realize that C-Dash was available. And he said, if I had known about C-Dash, I could have done my case report forms much faster. I could have started my trial two months earlier. And that was, um, you know, developed because of some of the innovation that Jana Woodcock was promoting in terms of yeah. letting, uh, de developing standards around a core data set and a set that's required across all trials. And I think this is really valuable to point out, Absolutely. like you said, where's the sweet spot? Because um, that allows investigators who do trials to get the same questions from each company and they don't have to meet I, all the different needs of every single person who puts together a trial. And so CDASH to me, I keep trying to promote the use of it up front because you always lose mm. the integrity when you map at the back end and it's costly and the value is obviously up front. So when you talk about all the therapeutic areas which are to augment C-Dash, I'd like to go back to Frank's question and what value do you see in that and where should you, do you think we should be going? Well, I that? think, I mean, from my yes. end, first of all, I think you, you raise a great example. Because again, just like I said, on the process side, when you're going for process efficiency, I want my case report forms to be consistent across all these clinical sites. I'm, I'm fully with you that doing it all up front makes complete sense. Now, Transborn actually was several years before um, IMI, but it was in J&J. &J, so it was the first time it came out of J&J. Uh, across therapeutic areas. So I, I actually have, have no disagreement. I, I agree with you on the front side. Um, so I, I do the Henry Ford thing because I'm often looking at this and my, my favorite quote from him is, if I only listen to my customers, I'd be building faster horses. And I think, you know, we've got to, we've got to kind of think um, a, a little bit towards this and saying that you want to both lead folks to your point, people that are designing clinicals, make sure they've got good tools in their hands so they are making their job easier up front, you know, and, and doing things like that. So on, on the Efficacy and efficiency side, it's fine. If we're talking about pooling clinical trials data down the road for secondary, tertiary, and other use, I get a little fuzzier. Meaning that I, you know, I, I'm. I was listening to questions. The last question, the gentleman, I think, who said, if you, you know, you get eighty percent of the value for twenty percent of the effort for that data use, I'm with them. Mm -hmm. So, can you uh, somebody answer the question about where do you think you know this whole thing with Padufa and the fifty-eight and five or whatever? How far do you think that can go in terms of bringing value? And where, what would you advise for people who are trying to develop the standards in that area? Well, I think, I think you have to figure out in the experiment where the asymptote is, is that's all, right? Where does more cost not equal more benefit? So that's why I fully, I actually think it's com a complete benefit to do it at the right cost, because that's what value is about. It's, it's what you get out and, you know, the government spends a lot of money. I'm very, I'm very cognizant. I want to make sure they're spending for the right reason, right? Um, so I, I just think it's, it's really at a point which, where, where Vicky said, what are the major fields? What parts of the review process are actually getting automated? We're looking at talks. We're looking at these things. You know, we can look at you and tell you what's going in and where it's not. We can tell you, like Vicky said, where they print it out, they put it on the wall, and data mining means they stand closer to the wall when they look at it, literally. So I think, I think it's looking at the different types of data coming in, and I, so I'm fully supportive of it. It's just a matter of it's not going to make it 
perfect. So don't get too far to the right on the asymptote as far as spending goes. That's all I'm saying. Well, and just to be real clear, what CDISC is doing isn't funded by FDA, just so everybody else in the room knows, because that uh, it's important to us how we spend our money. It, right, absolutely. Well. Right. It is time, though, and I and I it is a lot of time, and it's a lot of reviewers' time. And I'm not, again, not suggesting that we shouldn't do it. I just, I think what Eric and I are trying to articulate is. It solves a certain set of problems for process, and there are certain parts of review that are going to be very processed. But if we look forward, for example, in oncology again, where this is going, even from a review standpoint, ideally, if you're looking at a next-in-class product or you're looking at the same mechanism of action in a different indication, which is what we're going to see in oncology because these will be mechanism-based therapies, we would like to be able to look across other trials. And I'm not sure that this is going to solve all of those problems because we'll need flexible, agile tools. We'll need subject matter experts. And, and, and so I think what we're saying is, Yes, it's important effort, and obviously it's going to happen, but let's set our expectations at the right place, and let's set our time and energy spent on that, and, and make sure we put some equal thought into the analytics side, into the flexibility side, because we get to the point, and we saw this in the legacy data conversion, where we constrain ourselves by the standard and by the data model. And then what you wind up with is a whole bunch of columns of data that don't fit anywhere. And that's one of the problems with the warehouse model. Then you've got them all in these like other. And it's important information because as I said, some of that other data was actually phenotypic data, racial identification data. So, you know, it's just making sure we're smart about it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, but, but on this same theme of what's process and what makes reviews down the road more efficient, uh, put in the context of some of the real life examples that we've heard about where late, rather late in the day of classes of drugs, a signal emerges. I think one of the, well, someone has already referred to the so-called suicidality signal, and that created a lot of work and uh, uh, with the FDA, as you know. Uh, and even to this day, and, and I, I attended the advisory group in which the class labeling for suicidality for anti-epileptics was discussed. And it struck me, I, I, I was really puzzled because the criteria that were applied statistically made it impossible to answer the question whether or not there was equivalent risk across drugs. I won't go into the details. Uh, retrospectively, then, what does one put in place so that this kind of cumulative databases that academia, the FDA, and everyone is gathering allows us to intelligently interrogate across multiple classes of drugs and make intelligent decisions? And at a simple at a very simple level, I thought the idea of standardization was is at least those terms of risk and all, the adverse events or possible other things that were recorded, would be recorded more or less in the same way, recognizing the quality of data that would not be universally there. So I, it was a fairly simple notion. And, uh, you know, and I, I heard and I understood this 5550 or whatever you're calling it now as in that spirit of getting us together, and I noticed schizophrenia was the one one, so I'm a little familiar with that, too, because it's a very complex illness in which how we record symptoms and how we, well, I hate to use the word standardize, that record is abysmal, right, to be perfectly honest. And how could that not be a potentially positive thing for the long run to put a little more effort in there? Are we really wasting our money to do that to get back to the question? Is, is, are, you, are, you, are you really saying that no, that's No, I'm not effort? saying we're wasting our money. I'm saying that this is beyond the FDA, clearly, because it goes back to your exact point, in my, this is my opinion, that we need disease definition. We need disease taxonomy. And I really think that the NIH needs to be engaged in this effort. Clinicians need to be. We had an extensive discussion at the last IOM meeting in neuroscience about just this topic and the, the incredible need for this. I don't see that as CDISC's problem. I really don't. I see that as a bigger issue. 
for the medical community. So to the extent that CDIS can help drive or solve that problem, great. But I don't think that that is the FDA's, I don't think that that issue is solved by standardizing case report form fields. Yeah, that's, were, that's what I'm saying. And actually, I, I fully agree with you. I'm glad they didn't wait for more standards to do that study. Right. You know, so I, I think that's what, I mean, you, you know, you go with what you see and where, the, where you are with the data, but having better stuff to look, be, make it easier next time, of course it makes sense. I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to cut off questions until our panelists come up and, and um, then there'll be more opportunity for questions. So if our panelists could come up here and I'll start introducing you as you walk up. We, we will start with Laura Lyman Rodriguez, who is the Director of the Office of Policy, Communications and Education at NHGRI at the National Institutes of Health. She'll be followed by Meredith Nam, who is the Associate Director for Clinical Research Informatics at Duke. And then we'll have Neil Crescenzo, who is the Senior Vice President and General Manager for Health Sciences at Oracle. And finally, Michael Cantor, who is the Senior Director, Information Strategy and an Analytics at Pfizer's Clinical Informatics and Innovation Group. So, Laura, if you could start us off. <laughs> sure, I'd be happy to. Um, and I'm just going to put out up front that I was asked not to do slides, and I haven't done slides, but I make no promises about staying on track, because um, I, I definitely am a slide-driven um, speaker. So, I guess what from my, my basic response from today is how exciting it has been to sit in this room and listen to all of the different stakeholders be so excited about data sharing and see all of these other people struggling um, with these problems, not because I enjoy their struggle, but because um, these are issues that we at Genome have been thinking about um, for a while and at NIH in particular um, in a very specific way for the last um, six to seven years as we started putting together large data repositories to bring together genomic information with phenotype information um, and sort of bring that culture of rapid data sharing and broad data sharing of everything um, that you have in terms of the data that was very prominent in genomics to other disciplines where the culture was very different. Um, and so to try and take those principles and values that we heard about earlier um, for genomics and see how we could integrate them with, with other values um, in, different, in different areas. And so with regard to the standards conversation, um, I would say our approach to it was that our purpose was data sharing in itself. So all data was fit for that purpose. And so we did not, in, in constructing um, the database for genotypes and phenotypes, create standards to go forward. And I think that the database is still very successful. It's highly utilized. Um, and, and that has worked. And it gets to some of the other things that we heard a lot about just most recently about just do it. I mean, what we want to do is see progress made. Um, and there is value in doing that. That said, um, we also have efforts going on to look at how to develop some data standards. We have a Phoenix project that's looking at um, trying to create more standards around phenotypes, some of the taxonomies, so that we can have better vocabularies to talk between studies. And, and we do think that's important. Um, it can enhance quality. It's not a guarantee. Um, it's also something that is very much done better when it's early. Um, in the process so that you can implement it throughout and have that kind of um, streamlined access um, to the standards and, and that it's, it's not retrofitted. So it's really most valuable, I think, prospectively. And where we are right now is we have an enormous amount of data that's out there and we want to know how to use it and we want to know how to bring it together. Um, so my general thoughts for today is, is it would be wonderful if we could begin capturing the lessons learned from these studies that have gone out there and from many of the things that we've heard today and synthesize that in some way that is disseminated. So it's not just who's at the workshop or even watching on the web today, but it's out in the literature for other people to iterate on and to learn from and to expand um, to different scenarios without having to recreate the wheel um, completely. And I think in that way, 
um, you would begin to actually inform any future standards development as well, because you would see the things that would work in some frameworks that would be helpful. So the other thing, I guess, uh, another major point is that I see standards, we've talked a lot today about the technical side of standards, and really mostly we focused on the technical in terms of the scientific standards or the clinical standards, um, the rules of the road with, that we would put in place. But I think we also heard <laughs> in not so much um, of a constructed way, but anecdotally and often in terms of the problems about the standards that we need to build into this around the ethics and the responsible conduct of the research. Um, and I think those are equally important to synthesize and to put out so that we aren't spending so much time trying to figure out what's the appropriate way to de-identify information, um, to honor the contributions and to um, respect the privacy of the participants who do donate their time and their very sensitive information to what we're trying to do. Um, and so I think that is something else that we should think about as um, in, in, in a structured a way as we do about the scientific and, and clinical standards. So privacy obviously would be something to do, something um, to think about respect, to think about autonomy of the individuals, their choice. That's something we're struggling with. We heard about the ANPRM. Um, what we talked about was the identifiability issue. What we didn't talk about was another factor that's in there around informed consent and whether or not every, um, spec every um, piece of data or specimen that is used to generate data that goes into research should have been collected through with a consent specifically for research purposes or whether all of the clinical samples that we're using that often don't have consent for future use um, for research are okay and acceptable to come in. So that's another very large um, conversation that's evolving. Um, and we need to find a way. We heard today about how, how um, patients want to be asked. They want to be part of the process. They're willing to do this, but we do need to respect um, what they are exposing themselves to by participating um, and give them an opportunity to say yes or no, but we, if we then need to think about how to do that. That's hard to implement, um, but hard doesn't mean we don't do it. Um, there's also issues around transparency that are important and should be a standard in how things go forward um, with regard to the ethics and responsiveness of the information generated through the trial and how the trial will be conducted. Um, and then the last part, which I, I thought was interesting, and I, I hadn't heard it put quite this way before, but that's the gratitude aspect of it. And again, the more that we can do in that regard, um, I think the more rewarding the process will be for everyone involved. Um, the other aspect, um, separate from the technical issues, and I would actually put ethics and responsible conduct in that technical category in some regards, um, but a lot of the challenge was around the cultural or social and political, um, as someone put it this morning, um, aspects for this. And I think there are also things that we could synthesize from everything that we've heard today to put out for people to learn from. Um, and that could become a kind of framework for all of us to use, if not standards. But this need to align interests from, from what my own personal experience has been working within the NIH and just trying to bring academics together. Um, aligning interests is really hard. And, and the values are changing. So while it's great to hear that in the private sector, data is no longer viewed necessarily as power and there's a willingness to share, in the academic community, I think data still is power because of how it's tied to our um, professional advancement. And that is very hard to overcome and it, it's going to have to, to be overcome or, or find a way to accommodate it maybe. Um, to allow people to, or, or investigators to be more willing to participate. And then also, of course, the interests of the participants and the patients, of course. Um, they want to find a cure. They also want to contribute to helping others. And we need to be able to honor that as much as their own individual um, benefit that may or may not come. And again, that's also very hard to scale because um, of the ambivalence factor in terms of some people <laughs> having a very conservative view of privacy and some people being willing to share. Um, because of the fact that some people are healthy and don't have an interest in sharing and others are sick and they're willing to do anything. And that can be, so, so their opinions will change over time um, with regard to participating in this. And all of this speaks to common interests. We also talked about common values. I think we should find a way to identify what those values are and to integrate them into what we're doing. Um, flexibility is fundamental. Um, so that we can adapt our coalition, so that we can adapt um, our strategies for bringing data together, um, so that when we come up against a roadblock, we can figure out a way to build a new track to get around it. 
communication and transparency um, that's within, the, within any coalition, within the community, um, as well as back out to the public so that we maintain public trust. Resources was also mentioned a little bit, um, somewhat in terms of cost for data standardization, but it was mentioned once, and I would like to highlight it, is the resources to make this system work. Um, one thing we have learned at NIH is that, that data access committees and data submission, it all takes a lot of people time. Um, and it will be faster and more effective for the community if you can get dedicated people to do it instead of asking um, others to do it on top of their other jobs, grant administrators to do it um, in the evenings, which is just not an effective way um, to give it the attention it deserves. And then finally, of course, is trust. Um, and also, I think something that we didn't talk about, but faith, because sometimes you just have to have faith. Um, that everyone really is working with the best of intentions, and while you might not know how it's going to turn out, um, we'll figure it out along the way. And I guess with that, I will stop. Hi, and thanks so much for inviting me to be a part of the meeting today. Um, I want to tell you a few stories, um, but first, sort of a, as a panelist, I kind of want to do a job of maybe abstracting up a little, um, because at its core, reuse of data is really use other than those which were originally intended by people other than those who collected the data. And there's a lot rolled into there. there. There's a lot rolled into there about knowledge coming along with the data, as Dr. Axton referred to earlier. And, you know, if you buy from the information quality industry and sector that the data and information are an asset, then we would need to start thinking about that asset as something that might outlive us. Maybe in the terms of our lives, maybe some data that old aren't useful, but I think we've all experienced the departure of an important individual at a company and not been able to answer critical questions about the data. And what I really want to emphasize um, throughout the discussion, sort of like the Lorax who speaks for the trees, is I'm here to speak for the semantics. Because if, if the data aren't specifically defined well enough that, that others can use them who weren't involved in the original collection, then we as researchers really haven't done our jobs well. And that, that may be a little harsh, but there's a, also a recognition, I think, in the room that getting to that level of specificity requires standards that don't exist, and it also requires a level of rigor from the researcher, um, both at the trial or the study level, as well as at the individual data element level to include the semantic specificity that's necessary for humans to align the concepts according to the notion of human meaning, and also maybe for analytic tools that may automate or speed the review process to align those concepts according to notions of human meaning. And so, so now I'm going to tell you a story. Um, you know, I had the, the great fortune um, to work with the Clinical Trials Network from NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse Treatment. And uh, in 2006, around that time, NIDA put up um, the first standards-based public data share. And NIDA did an incredibly brave thing. Those heroes actually supported the de-identification of the data um, and the aligning of the data according to the CDISC SDTM standard and putting that data on the web where it's publicly available, of course, with requests to use the data and, and important infrastructure like that. But but I also want to sort of sing the praises of the heroes um, and use this as an example at NIDA, who years before the data share went available, and it, it's up on ctndataShare.org if anybody is interested. Um, years before that, there was a committee of investigators and, and research teams from the Clinical Trials Network who actually defined the concepts for the individual trials not just a common battery of assessment, which, by the way, makes the data set of 27 trials even more valuable, but defining the other data elements that weren't standardized in validated instruments or tools. And because those individuals had done that and had implemented that uniformly across the network, it was, it was relatively easy 
to be able to find a uniform and a consistent mapping into the CDISC SDTM, um, which, which some people may call it a content standard. I tend to call it more of a format standard um, if you leave out the CDISC terminology part. But we were able to, to put those concepts all into similar buckets so that people who use the data could set the data sets on top of each other as they would want to do to do a pooled analysis or as an FDA reviewer might want to do to look for class effects across compounds. So, so that's one story from 2006. And, and then I'm going to fast forward. Um, we've recently completed um, the initial year of the schizophrenia data standards um, work under one of the FDA R24s. And I'd like to thank the two members of the Clinical Expert Review Committee who, who've mentioned that work today. Um, they've actually been doing the, the very detailed and, and difficult work of taking a set of data elements that have been harmonized from phase three pivotal trial case report forms submitted with a schizophrenia indication into a set of, of common data elements. And so the, those went out to the Clinical Expert Review Committee. They're out twice. Um, they're now out. They have the HL7 ballot for the standard data elements. The first ballot's closed. We intend to ballot again. Um, one ballot cycle is, is pretty close for the clinical professional societies to convene a working group. I think one out of five actually got it to us within the one month ballot cycle and uh, those are also heroes who were able to do that. But what I want to tell you about the schizophrenia data standards effort is um, you know, I've been involved in about 10 therapeutic area data element standards project at, at this point in my career. Um, and when we went into schizophrenia, I hadn't ever synthesize them from case report forms before. I'd always worked directly with clinical expert committees in order to define the content. And when we did that, I was just about certain that I was going to see an asymptotic effect, that each trial that we abstracted data elements off the case report forms and synthesized them together, that each one would provide fewer and fewer and fewer new instances of new semantic content or new data elements. That is indeed not what we found. <laughs> and, and Dr. Fitzmartin earlier mentioned the FDA's pain and, and the plight of the FDA reviewer that has to look at data across compounds or that's taping the stuff up to the wall. Um, I now understand what those people have to go through in order to look at the data. Not only that, um, it, in the event when there are post-marketing safety issues that arise in order to combine the data from the trials. Because given some of the different operationalizations of important variables that we found, important variables, things like variables that were used to define an episode of disease, very critical variables were operationalized completely different by different sponsors. And, and it's not until we start attacking things at the definition level, at the clinical definition level, that we're going to be able to support that, that compiling and that reuse of data, whether it's reuse from healthcare to research or reuse within a trial, sending data around and integrating it more easily, reuse in regulatory decision making, or secondary data analysis um, by other researchers. It all depends on, on really the data element as the atomic level of information exchange. And an approach that's used in virtually every other industry, aside from ours. And uh, and so I, you know, I want to close um, by saying that, and sort of emphasizing that in this process, what what's really important and key is is not necessarily the synthesis work, which which is difficult and it does take time, um, but having authoritative clinical definitions because we won't ever truly impact the burden on clinical investigational sites until we're able to facilitate using data that are collected in care. It's when we can provide a, a concept unique identifier as a string that can pull that data element through from an electronic health record system all the way to a clinical research system that we're going to be able to affect the burden on the clinical investigational sites. And I'm under no, um, you know, delusions, speaking of schizophrenia, that, uh, that we'll be able to do that with all of the data or even with half of the data. But when we can, I think it's critical to do that. Um, the last thing I want to remark about is the, the discussion earlier um, that basically data standards don't equal data quality. And I, I'd like to offer um, a, a, a way of thinking about data and information quality from the information quality community. 
and they, they conceptualize data and information quality as a multidimensional concept. And so accuracy might be one dimension that it's important for us to measure, monitor, and control. So also may be timeliness or completeness. So also may be specificity and data definition. With that, I thank you. Thank you. Neil? Thank you, Lynn. I want to thank the uh, Institute of Medicine for the opportunity to allow Oracle to share our view on sharing clinical trial data. Uh, as one of the largest providers of technology in this field, both the clinical trial software as well as open source technologies, such as mentioned earlier, like MySQL and Java, you know, we have a strong corporate interest in the, in the area. And personally, having been in industry before coming to Oracle and before that IBM a number of years ago, it also adds to my uh, personal commitment. You could tell I'm the token Silicon Valley IT company guy because I'm the one without the tie. <laughs> my, uh, my colleague, Dr. Giannassi, uh, wearing jeans, but we bought him a jacket on the way here, so don't worry, we're going to fit right in. So there are really three areas that I'd like to comment on, not to um, speak about some of the things that have been mentioned so comprehensively earlier today. Um, the three are scale, uh, data standardization, and new collaboration models around data standardization. And third, the variety of data. So hopefully, since it's late in the day, these three initials will help you remember this, SDV, which I'm sure no one in the room is laughing, source data verification. So I thought this was a clinical trial crowd. But <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things I wanted to talk about scale, and I think Dr. Kush talked about this, because CDISC's work is done on such a global scale, as is HL7 and others, is really scale about what's happening around the world. Because obviously, this has been uh, convened by the Institute of Medicine. There's been a lot of focus on what we're grappling with here in the United States. But we're fortunate to work in a number of projects around sharing or accessing clinical information, whether clinical trial or medical information, around the world. And I'll tell you that we see in all the requirements coming out of these RFPs and these government efforts, and a few of which we uh, have provided the software for, include the Singapore Countrywide Electronic Health Record and then the Australian Countrywide Electronic Health Record. Uh, I think all of you are aware that some countries, England and others, have stubbed their toes a little bit on some of these efforts. But we now have sort of the 10 years later, lessons learned. Uh, we're going to budget for it intelligently, I think, effort in this field. And what we're seeing in all of these projects is uh, a heavy emphasis on data standards as a requirement for being part of the whole exercise. All of the ones I mentioned are uh, based on HL7 RIM-based models. We're seeing requirements around uh, using CDIC standards for the clinical trial data. Uh, and I think one of the things that, you know, unfortunately, we may start seeing even a little bit faster outside the United States than we see here is a requirement to use standards for these large projects that are done at a country level. Of course, all these countries being a bit smaller than the United States, so a little bit easier, perhaps, to execute. Although I will say we're now involved in the project, which, like most of these, has been going on for a number of years and will hopefully come to fruition in Brazil. It's 180 million people, so you know, we're starting to get to levels that perhaps mirror some of the challenges we have in the United States. The other thing I wanted to talk about scale, both in terms of the collaboration between industry and the regulatory process, as well as um, what's happening on a global basis, is really the explosive growth in clinical trials outsourcing. Uh, I haven't heard too much talk about this here today. It's a very real phenomenon or exercise in the industry. Uh, you've seen names of some of these big CROs, whether Covans, Quintiles, et cetera, obviously involved in a number of these efforts. Um, and and we're, we work with a number of them, well, all of them pretty much uh, around the world. Now, I think one of the things that's not always appreciated is that kind of collaboration is going to be important. And the service providers, as well as the sponsors, academia, and others, need to be brought into this equation. Uh, and it's one of the things I think we've seen a fair amount of innovation across different companies. Uh, one of the projects at Pfizer that some of you may be aware of is called a Pfizer Clinical Aggregation Layer Project. Not the most uh, sexy term, perhaps, but uh, Pfizer decided to outsource virtually all their clinical trials, the big phase two, phase three trials, to ICON and Parexcel. In the midst of that, they started thinking about some of the things that have been mentioned here today, which is how are we going to actually maintain the controls, the privacy issues, the sharing uh, protocols that we want to do around that process and with that data, because I'm sure as many of you aware, when you enter in an arrangement like that, you can not only outsource some of the mechanical elements, but often a lot of the decision-making criteria that perhaps you wouldn't uh, 
you know, prepare, be prepared to do. So I think that's an area where, you know, we see a lot of um, innovation, even though it's a fairly new project and obviously on a very large scale, given the size of Pfizer's portfolio. You know, I think people are kind of just think stepping back and saying, wow, so we're going to have all this trial data. It's actually all on our servers at Oracle. It's all being shared with these other big CROs. How are we going to operate in a world like that? So the policy and practices uh, implementations around the outsourcing arena, I think, is another area that is really a different scale than some of the projects that at least I've heard so far discover, uh, discussed today. The second area, the D, is data standardization and some of the new collaboration models. Um, Transcelerate Biopharma, both given the press and some of the previous mentions. I won't cover that again. I will say the one thing I didn't hear mentioned about Transcelerate it was mentioned that it took about 10 years of meetings for that to potentially come to pass. And I think for any of you who've dealt with the sponsor side of the business quite a bit, you know that's because for 10 years the antitrust lawyers all told them not to form Transcelerate Biopharma or they'd be in, or they'd be in court. But eventually they figured that out, I presume. Um, and I think one of the things that really uh, makes me optimistic about that effort uh, is the fact that you know it has a CEO, an experienced individual, formerly from J and J. Uh, the organizations have committed funding, so there'll be staff, there'll be organizational structure around it. It's not you know as somebody, a few people have mentioned a number of times, a bunch of people's second or third jobs, and the nights are on the weekend. So. I think that's a, a promising start. There's one that I didn't hear mention that we're a member of, along with many other organizations, called the Pistoia Alliance. I suspect it wasn't mentioned because it does kind of deal at the GORPI technical data transfer level. That's probably not quite as interesting to people in the room. Um, I actually copied down their, their mission. We aim to lower barriers to innovation by improving the interoperability of R&D business processes. We differ from standards groups. I don't know if uh, Becky or Chuck or others would agree with this, but because we bring together the key constituents to identify the root causes that lead to R&D inefficiencies and develop best practices and technology pilots to overcome common obstacles. So this is another effort. It's largely currently mostly focused on figuring out ways to send sequence data around in a secure and, and economical fashion, which is, a, which is a big challenge in and of itself. But I think that's another example of where we're seeing innovation um, outside some of the mechanisms that we've heard discussed today and a new collaboration model that could give rise to some of the initiatives and innovation we've seen in similar collaboration models that have been mentioned earlier around the IT industry, the semiconductor industry, and others. So the third uh, area I wanted to talk about was variety. Uh, it's been mentioned a couple of times, uh, this concept of big data. If we were at an IT conference, it would have been mentioned about every 20 minutes. Uh, it's now a very popular term. Uh, when you think about big data, if you're at a genomics conference, they talk about the volume of data. If you're at other conferences, they talk about different elements. But big data really is around three Vs, actually, the variety of data, the volume of data, and the velocity with which you need the data. Um, when you think about the type of data that's been uh, discussed here, um, there's a lot of ways that data is going to be necessary to be passed around and the size and the complexity of it is going to be substantial. I think what we're seeing is actually some of the greatest uh, initiatives or most rapidly advancing initiatives around data sharing is around post-marketing surveillance. I think the reasons for this are, uh, first of all, regulatory environment, particularly in Japan, and what uh, MHLW is now required regarding drugs that are being sold in that country. I think the uh, regulatory environment in Europe and now in the States is becoming far more prescriptive around post-marketing surveillance. And I think we're seeing a lot of initiatives in that arena as people begin to see that this is coming and they obviously want to be ready. Uh, not to take any of Richard's thunder from Medtronic, I did ask his permission to talk about this, but there's a very interesting initiative that they're doing called the Global Post-Approval Network. And I think this is a good example of one of the questions that was uh, we were asked to address uh, around um, whether we want to invest in infrastructure or not. I think that's a very innovative example of looking to invest in a worldwide infrastructure around post-marketing surveillance that I think is going to have additional advantages over time in terms of, frankly, just informing everybody at companies like Medtronic or throughout the medical device industry on what's often called real-world data around devices and drugs. One last point, just to uh, give you an example of this. Uh, Pfizer recently hired a gentleman, uh, came from a large health plan, believe it or not, into Pfizer. And uh, that gentleman's title is VP Real World Data and Analytics. So you know we're doing something different when you have to actually title the person in charge of it with something like real world data. Thank you very much. Thank you, Neil.
And we saved one of the most exciting initiatives for the last. Michael Cantor will be speaking about e-placebo that Pfizer is leading. Thank you, uh, Lynn and Frank, for, and the IOM for inviting me to speak. Thank you all for staying. And I just have to start with our typical disclaimer. These are my views, not necessarily the views of um, Pfizer. Um, so the, the panel is about standards that I wanted to talk about in terms of a project that we're working on um, called e-placebo. And I think, you know, just kind of the summary of, of what we, we've been encountering with this uh, is a theme that's been going on throughout most of the day, is that the social and the cultural and the incentives part of this are really much more challenging uh, than the, you know, than the issues, uh, technical issues in, in building these kind of projects. So e was is an idea that's been kicking around at, at Pfizer for a long time, probably the last two or three years. Um, you've heard a lot of other projects that are going on around placebo, like the CAMD initiatives. Tomorrow you'll hear about the SAGE initiative as well. But overall, our idea is uh, to pull data from placebo and control arms across multiple clinical trials in multiple therapeutic areas, so not necessarily limited to Alzheimer's disease, for example, but really across all trials, into a, a, a mark that you could actually use as a research utility. And I think the way we were able to get this started is actually we had kind of the, the perfect storm of things happening uh, within the company. I mean, we had a, a group that was called uh, Business Intelligence that I was a part of, and Ed Bowen, who's here in the audience, was also a part of. We had support for doing some innovative work, and we were able to actually get the people who knew the data well enough to bring it all together in, in one repository. Um, so what we, we see this, this the potential for this, uh, there's several, obviously, as you've heard during the day for placebo data in general. But for us, really, it's, it's using as potentially as a comparison group to help evaluate um, events that you might see in trials if you want to get background rates for events, um, and also potentially to look at placebo effect as some other initiatives are doing in a broader population, uh, or actually potentially to reduce the size of a placebo arm that you would need in a, in a clinical trial that you were designing. So our internal mart so far that we built has about 20,000 patients in it from uh, hundreds of trials, again, across all of our different therapeutic areas. But we think that this utility, this research utility, could be a lot more useful with a much broader participation, so a broader industry-wide participation, for example. Um, and we presented this to the CMD steering committee last month. Um, and we're also, this is also part of an initiative at Pfizer that's called uh, Data Without Borders that our research uh, business technology group, our uh, R&D business technology group has been leading. Um, and it's also kind of linking along with these other collaborations that, that Pfizer is doing, like our Centers for Therapeutic, Therapeutic Innovation that we're working with a lot of academic medical centers. So anytime you're trying to build one of these large-scale databases that highlights the importance of standards, um, it's really essential for looking at cross-program, and particularly if you're going to do a cross-industry or cross-academia type of uh, initiative, uh, you'll need that for the analysis. Um, if you think about the CETIS standard, you know, it's really, it's basically got very, relatively wide adoption, but with, like a lot of standards, you know, the way it's actually implemented locally has slight differences that oftentimes make the analysis a lot more difficult afterwards. You can actually lose some of the details there. Um, it certainly also gives you uh, a little more uh, confidence in your data quality, but really you have to look at that in terms of the questions that you're asking, and like people have, have talked about to, during to the day as well, the reproducibility of the results that you're getting as well when you're looking across different data sources. So our, our major issues that we had when we were working with the placebo are really two. Um, and because of those issues, we ended up only using relatively recent studies uh, in our database. The first issue is along the technical issue, and that's really about the standards internally. So as many of you know, Pfizer, we've acquired several companies throughout the years. So we have data from several different companies, from several different systems, you know, that are ultimate, that are, can be 20 or 30 years old or, or, or older. And so we only really had a consistent Pfizer data standard implemented within the last decade. So it ended up, we ended up being only really uh, practically able to use the more recent, the recent uh, studies for, for this project. We also had issues with, uh, so that's a technical issue. And the, looking at the other issue is really around informed consent. And uh, in the past, you know, informed consent was written in a very narrow way so that data could be used particularly for that specific trial. But actually, uh, in, for Pfizer as well, lately, our, our informed consent uh, language has been a little bit broader. So you can actually use the, the data for research that's not directly related to your original initial study. And that obviously makes it a lot easier to use that study in a, in a pooled uh, initiative. And we think that actually the informed consent issue is almost more challenging because, you know, the informed, you can actually always change your database schema. Once you have an informed consent down, that, that's really fixed. There's really no changes to that. So, you know, the, if you look at standards, how this would facilitate these types of initiatives, I think a lot of these issues have come up already today, but it's, it's unlikely that, you know, this, the process of, of pooling data is ever going to be seamless. But if you have some agreed upon standards, it makes this much easier. 
Um, but then, of course, the question is, you know, which standard you're using, who controls that standard, who makes ultimately make those decisions. You know, there was there were questions that came up earlier um, about, you know, you have a lot of academics in the room, you have a lot of collaborators in the room, and they can't agree upon a standard. Um, we have the issue internally as well. You have internal standards that you're supposed to use, and the trial teams, you know, end up using them on uh, and implementing them kind of in, in a, I don't want to say a haphazard way, but in a way that's not necessarily, you know, files that standard exactly. And the question is, how does that happen? And I think part of it is the lack of political will for people to say, you know what, this is the standard, this is what you have to do, use it, and here are the consequences. And, you know, it's interesting that the NIH, uh, well, there's a potential issue, I think, for the NIH is the funding agency. And, you know, they're, they're fighting with the academics sometimes who, for people who to adopt, the, to adopt a standardized process, but they control the purse strings, you know. And so, there's, uh, and so I think that there's, there's some potential there for, to, to do some enforcement around uh, using standards, um, both on the politically and economically as well. So ultimately, our, our goal for eplacebo is to, is to provide a resource that would be very inclusive, um, uh, would be relying on standards and would span disease areas rather than having a very specific limited uh, database limit to a single disease so that researchers could use this data for, whatever, for really broad purposes. And you can also get the quantity of populations that would be broadly representative. Um, we assume that initially there would be some type of governance board that would confirm the scientific validity of questions, but really the, the ideal would be to have this almost as a self-service you know, data that, uh, set that could be used by any, for any legitimate research purpose. Um, if, it, if it is set up as a repository, we would assume it would be hosted by an, a third party like uh, CPATH. But um, if, I think there's also potential to have the, excuse me, the distributed data network uh, used as well so that the data stays at its institutions and then it's queried in a federated manner. I think the, the last thing, getting back to the incentives issue, and this project really brings up internally for us too, the incentives around preparing data for reuse and when the process should occur, either if it's upfront or, or in, in, in the end, as a lot of people have talked about as well. Uh, I think when you're, when you're dealing with something as complex as clinical trials, you really need to invest in that upfront um, and make sure also if you're, using, you know, if you're using this, that it's also, um, you have kind of almost a separate repository that's not part of day-to-day -day operations where you can actually make that investment as well. I think standards obviously make it much easier to overcome the technical hurdles to broad-based cooperative projects like eplacebo, but you really need the right set of incentives uh, for people and institutions to ultimately uh, contribute their data. So thank you very much. Thank you. Now we can open up for questions. Sorry for all the people I cut off before. Are you bringing back the other panelists? <laughs> <laughs> I think the FDA has gone. My, the FDA has left. But. My, yeah, the FDA is gone, so I can't ask that question. But, but I did want to. Uh, you know, we're. You know, this is a, a bit of a, uh, um, a goodwill festival here, and yet I'm hearing that we're only pooling placebo data, and in CAMD, you know, that Alzheimer's trials were not active arms were not contributed. So. You know, let's talk about that since, you know, we really do have key people here who could be influential in their companies with, uh, with um, academic partners, with the organizations, with regulatory. So, is, you know, what, what, what do people on the panel think? Carolyn, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, you know, why, why can't we do that? And they did it with IMI, I mean, uh, in schizophrenia and in Alzheimer's. We heard this morning they did it with uh, cardiovascular. Um, I think about this even more broadly, about where are the edges of the pre-competitive space? I mean, th that, that's something I think, we've, we haven't talked about that today, but that, that really is what we need to look at, to define where it is that we can, that all the companies can collectively gain by pooling not only data, but expertise and other resources, so that they all get something that none of them could acquire on their own. And, and that's something that I, I know is evolving, but it, it now, I hope, is moving into the space where people are willing to, um, to uh, waive uh, their 
IP anxiety um, in, in order to uh, get more benefit out of money they've already spent, data they've already collected, failed trials that they're not going to go back to, where, where collectively we could have an enormous public and private benefit um, if, if people were willing to contribute that um, to a, a common um, source that, that was accessible by everyone. Can I uh, I'll add to that also, um, is that I think one of the big issues for why people don't want to share um, active arm data is the worry, and it's some, potentially the risk is a hypothetical risk, but it's generally, it's, it's not only the IP risk, a lot of times it's the risk, the, the potential risk of, of uncovering safety events. Um, you know, we have, we have the issue when we're, and that's one, of, that's one of the big reasons that's been taking us, you know, years to actually get this initiative off the ground is even with the, well, because uh, we're mainly focusing on placebo uh, data, but we're thinking of looking at control arm data and active arm data as well and pulling that. And, you know, the question is, well, what if you pull all this data and you see a trend that wasn't discovered before, then what, what happens with that? So I think that's a, you know, sometimes that, that may or may not be a, a real risk, but that's uh, definitely a perceived risk and people are, are worried about that. I just wanted to follow up, and you know, so the question: If the FDA folks were still here, and I guess everyone's gone, did Eric go as well? Uh, you know, was you know, how are they going to help? And maybe we can readdress this when Janet. I think Janet's going to be here tomorrow, if I understand. My name is uh, Kelly McFeary, and I have a question, probably for Neil, but any panelists, please speak up. Um, I'm here on behalf of Northrop Grumman's health IT business. Um, and we spend a lot of time listening to vendors come to us and say, we really should be the, one of the solutions you bring into one of your government customers. Um, and the test we give them is always about unstructured data. Uh, oftentimes, they're really good at one kind and not the other. And we see the clinical standards as necessary but not sufficient. We see um, we've invested a lot in CDIS, so we care about that. We um, invest in uh, a lot of neuroimaging, a lot of um, genomic skill sets, but we we rarely ever find um, somebody who can really tackle what I think we think is going to be the elephant in the room down the road for clinical trials, which is integrating the disparate data types. We've talked a lot about big data types and complex data types with, with uh, dispersed provenance, but we haven't talked a lot today about uh, the really disparate data types that come from radiology images integrated with genomic image, uh, genomic data and then the conventional EHR data and clinical data. So if, if you, Neil, could talk about what Oracle's doing to invest or anybody else wants to jump in. Um, well, I think the, I'll just make a couple of points maybe on the technology aspect of it and other people can comment. I think, first of all, one of the reasons you haven't seen quite as much focus on that is because there's so much opportunity for improvement in all the things you already have heard for the last eight hours, and obviously that hasn't exactly reached its uh, end game yet. Um, but from our perspective, we bought the leading company in analyzing unstructured data called Endeca about a year ago. In fact, that target example that people may be familiar with with the pregnancy, that's the Endeca software. Not everybody knows the end of that story, but after the father was proven a little bit, well, anyway, it's an interesting story for those who are aware of it. But at the end of the day, what Target did, instead of stopping sending a pregnancy uh, coupon for things to, to uh, teenage girls, they just started including more coupons for cornflakes, oil changes, and, uh, you know, blouses, so it didn't look so obvious they were sending the coupons. So anyway, <laughs> so this is, this is what you have to look forward to with unstructured text mining. Um, so I think the, you know, we just announced on Monday this $100 million project with the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, and that's a $10 billion institution, so they can afford to spend money like that. Those sorts of people are focused on that, and uh, I just think, you know, it's still a little bit early days for a lot of other people, at least in the academic arena, because there's just so many other demands on their IT dollars or their, their clinical dollars. But there's a lot of exciting things happening in pharma, so if you want to address that. Right, so, uh, so the Cal uh, is, has you know, been consuming a, a lot of my time uh, in, the last few, in, in the last few months, but um, it's certainly um, something that we're, that we're thinking of as well. So that's uh, because you're right, you need a resource for the omics data, uh, you need a resource for the tr traditional clinical trial data, you need a resource for the imaging data. Right now, those are all disparate. And you know, our question is too, is how we're still working through how the omics data, for example, is, is going to get in there. And then how do you work with the alliance partners um, as well? So I, I don't have a, a great an I don't have an answer, but you know I think you're right. Those those we're all we're all working through that, and we're working with you know the, the Oracle system to to work on that too now. 
Yeah, hi, Lynn. And, and Cass. Yeah. Uh, so it's been a great afternoon. I'm Josie Briggs. I, I work at the NIH, do various things there. Um, but I I've, want to return to a topic that's come up recurrently all afternoon, which is the challenge of, of getting a consensus around uh, data definitions and data standards. Um, and as I've thought back as I've been listening to this terrific conversation about several, some of my recent experiences in, in this, this arena, uh, and, and I wanted to hear from some of these very knowledgeable panelists what, what you thought about some of the different models that we use to do that. Um, Walter Korshitz mentioned the clinical data element process, which NINDS has been leading, which has typically involved bringing together experts in uh, narrow disease entities and trying to get to work from their understanding of their disease to, to data definitions. I've been one of the co-chairs of the PROMISE initiative, and that's really been led uh, scientifically by psychometricians who've had a kind of big... Uh, uh, view and, and have tried to develop definitions, and we haven't always seen those very avidly taken up by experts in the communities, the cl clinical trialists, uh, because they had their own way to measure depression and that was HAMD and they weren't going to use the, the new uh, approaches. Um, and, and certainly one uh, thought about this is in general when diseases are poorly understood, uh, like back pain, which is one we're working on right now, it's really, really hard to get consensus. But, but Carolyn, I know you must have a lot of thought about this, and I'd be interested in thoughts about, about the process of, of developing uh, consensus and, and common data elements, whether it should come from a broader conceptual framework or, or up from clinical uh, expertise. So I'm a clinician, and for me, my, my whole focus, even in the job I hold now, <coughs> is all about patients. And, and I think Lynn pointed out that my whole career has been about standards at some point or other. I mean, I spent 20 years um, being a clinician um, at Mass General Hospital. And, and then I was concerned about developing standards around, for, for the College of American Pathologists, around the way we report out cancer specimens and, and common data elements and common definitions for what we were calling um, a, a grade in a given in cancer, et cetera. And I do believe that this has to come from the bottom up. This has to come from the clinicians who are dealing with the cancers, who are dealing with the patients, who are dealing with the real diseases. And it's not always easy. Um, it, first of all, you're never going to succeed if you impose this on them. They have to, th this, this is much like the process that I talked about in CPAT, this consensus driven. It's difficult, but someone else mentioned this method, locking people in the room and you're not going to come out until you ha you come to consensus. It is possible for them to do that, and and they do benefit from it once that once it has happened. And and there's been this huge evolution in medicine ever since I've been in it. From well, someone called it expert, based, but you know I I think of it as the the difference between evidence based medicine and eminence-based medicine. Um, it it was really um, when I first trained it it was all about poetic license. And now we think about quality medicine as being standardized and that there are really practice guidelines and this is the way we measure quality in medicine. And I think this is also true that this comes up from the bottom. It's, 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 it's evidence-based, it's clinician-driven, um, and someone has to enforce it. And I wanted to ask the panel um, what they thought of, now the NIH doesn't have the authorities from the government to enforce something. They're not a regulatory agency, but they can put it in terms and conditions of awards. As I said, they control the purse strings. But the FDA could regulate this. And, and I, was, I was wondering what the panel thought of some degree of standardization, um, evidence-based um, standardization, where necessary and appropriate, being regulated. Just a question. Yeah, so let me, I want to answer, um, or at least respond to Josie's question first. Um, you know, when, 
in the first R24, when we did schizophrenia and also CV imaging um, under the same award, you know, it came from a place of having done several therapeutic area data standards efforts. And when we first started out, um, actually was under um, one of Bob's roadmap contracts doing cardiology for ACS. Um, we actually went first to the clinical professional societies and to groups of clinicians and practicing clinicians for definitions of those data elements. Um, what we did under the R24 literally is run two processes heads, head to head. Um, we had we continued the cardiology process with, a, with CV imaging because those groups in ACC and AHA and other cardiovascular professional societies were already engaged and already ready literally to jump on defining those data elements. Um, in schizophrenia, it, it was a little different. I was sort of starting with schizophrenia de novo. And so we took a very centralized approach with schizophrenia and I gathered the knowledge initially not directly from humans but from the way humans had encoded that knowledge on case report forms. So it's not that the initial information wasn't expert based, it was, it was just from a different source. Um, what we found with the schizophrenia is that um, doing more of the work in a central format and providing a clinical expert committee um, and then later the clinical professional society working groups um, draft data element list with full definitions, valid values, valid values defined, all that sort of stuff that they was straw man they could shoot at. I was amazed at how consistent the comments were from the first round for schizophrenia. Absolutely amazed. And if anybody else wants to power in on that. I need your help. Watson's not working right now. Uh, it goes to Neil's comments. What was the name of the admiral who brought all the chip guys together back in the, what was it? Yeah, who was that, Barry? I forgot his name. But your point, is very important, Neil. We are in a global environment. That's why we can do things in the United States together that we couldn't do before because the market is immense. My concern is that, and I listened to the debates last night, I learned one thing, don't celebrate your anniversary the night before. <laughs> uh, but back to the serious. We're in a competitive environment uh, the GPRD became the CPRD this year. Uh, John Parkinson bragged to me that he's got 13 million patients and an extra $100 million, and his charter from uh, the Prime Minister is to go to 100 million, uh, 55 million patients in the US, uh, UK. And they're also putting other money in other pro uh, projects. And in a document which was issued in 2010, they state very clearly that the purpose is to better recruit patients to do clinical testing over there, because every one of you know that 40% of our studies here fail because of patient recruitment. Imagine what we're going to have in terms of competition with Brazil, with the Far East, India. It's all going to happen. Well, they I tell me that there are people around the world. So we can do a lot of things together. And this is my lawyer antitrust from the fellowship they paid for me way back when. But we can do a lot more. We, and Shakespeare was correct in terms of hanging the lawyers, but the lawyers have to know that they're in business in their law departments for one thing, to say yes, to figure out how to say yes. And that barrier's got to end. Well, when you meet the legal department who thinks their job is to say yes, please call me because <laughs> I, I want a picture, picture of that gentleman on my wall. By the way, I mean, I was fortunate to be with the Prime Minister when he announced this data initiative back in December. Um, actually, Michael, you were there too. It was at the conference. Uh, uh, and we all had great hopes. I've spent, what month is this? I've spent 10 months. That, that HES database with 55 million patients, they still haven't figured out how to let the data go yet. The CPRD, which he says he has 12 million patients, is actually only eight. John Bell, the advisor of the Prime Minister for Life Sciences Research, told me that 
72 hours ago and still people haven't figured out how to get that i mean so you know i I think you're right that some of the other countries have taken a proactive attitude and particularly in the uk because of the transparency open data initiatives but it's still going to be tough to get that data and do useful things with it because um, all the organizations that have been told to try and make that available for research have never done that before in their lives so it's it's going to take a while but i think your point is right is that if other countries are going to take that approach we don't want to fall behind on utilizing the data that we have in the U.S. healthcare system. Let me make one quick remark. The day before yesterday, Rob Kaladner and other people working with Rob went live with the medical record system in Rwanda. Okay, we have time for one last question. Oh, I hate being the last one. <laughs> Deborah Leonard from Wild Cornell Medical College, and I'm a member of the Genomics Roundtable. I was wondering... In the Genomics Roundtable, we had discussions about the very significant importance of disease characterization, which has come up a number of times in in how you manage the data and aggregate so that there are common definitions. So I have a kind of two-part question. One is, when will we move to a genomics definition of disease? And around cancer, you can think about that, but around back pain, I'm not sure you can think about that but it could give you the racial ethnic background in a better characterized way. And then we know that genetics isn't everything, so what is being done to standardize environmental exposure data or at least have tools to capture that in a better way so you understand the full interaction that the genome and the environment have? So I, I'm, I know that the Environmental Health Sciences Institute has some initiatives, and I think they have they were looking at how to do data sharing better and more broadly um, earlier this spring, and I think had a new initiative that they wanted to go forward with um, to do that. So I, I can't speak specifically to what that is. We had a program 2004, which I can mark by when my son was born, um, that initiated um, a four-year program to look at genes and environment, and part of that, the environmental end of it, was actually to create some standards because it was so hard to do, and there needed to be some work done just to have any basis a- against which to compare the data. Um, and that was a-, a secretarial initiative, so it was money for four years, and that is included, in it. and it's all available through the database for genotypes and phenotypes, and people are using it. Um, but of course, there's there's more to do. Okay, thank you, and I want to thank all of our panelists for an excellent job.